For a long time it was held that the Neanderthals were stupid, primitive subhumans, shambling, lacking symbolism. Turns out that that's not true at all. Certain populations in the world today still have three to five percent of Neanderthal uh, DNA. Tucked away in the rugged terrains of the Altai Mountains, where the borders of Russia, China, Mongolia and Kazakhstan meet, lies a fascinating piece of history that has captured the imaginations of archaeologists and historians alike. The Denisova Cave. This is uh, a, a, an issue that I go into in, in America before. And what first drew me into it was uh, Denisova Cave mm -hmm. uh, in Siberia. This isn't just any cave, it's a treasure trove of human evolution nestled in an area known for its breathtaking biodiversity and complex geological history. The mountains themselves are alive with a rich variety of plants and animals, setting the perfect backdrop for a story that's as much about the natural world as it is about our ancient ancestors. I think everybody's heard of the Neanderthals, and these days I think everybody's heard of the Denisovans as well. The story of Denisova Cave began to unfold in the 1970s when Soviet scientists first explored its depths. At that time, their eyes were set on unraveling the geological and paleontological mysteries of the region, largely overlooking the cave's potential to unlock secrets of our past. It's named after Denis, an 18th century hermit who once called the cave home, adding a touch of human history to its ancient walls. With its intricate network of chambers and galleries, the cave hinted at stories of long-term habitation by early humans, waiting just beneath the surface to be discovered. But it wasn't until 2008 that the cave truly stepped into the spotlight, thanks to the discovery of a small finger bone. In Russia, in Denisova Cave, they find a single pinky bone from a little finger. And what they discover is, this isn't a Neanderthal, this isn't an anatomically modern human being, this is another human species. This wasn't just any bone, it belonged to the Denisovans, an ancient group of hominins previously unknown to science. Suddenly the world was paying attention, eager to learn more about these mysterious inhabitants. The cave, with its rich layers of history buried within, revealed that it had been a bustling crossroads for different groups over tens of thousands of years. What's particularly intriguing about the Denisova cave is not just its archaeological wealth, but also its location. Nestled in a remote part of the Altai Mountains, reaching it is no small feat. The harsh climatic conditions add an extra layer of challenge for those daring enough to explore its secrets. Yet it's precisely these obstacles that make the cave so alluring to researchers from across the globe. Every expedition brings us closer to understanding not just the Denisovans, but the broader narrative of human history. Imagine stumbling upon a piece of the puzzle that is human history, hidden away in the depths of Siberia's Denisova cave. The Denisovans are a bit of a mystery, genetically distinct from both modern humans and Neanderthals. Their DNA tells us they branched off from Neanderthals around 400,000 years ago, enriching the narrative of the Pleistocene era's human saga. But when it comes to what they looked like, we're mostly in the dark. Our clues? Just a finger bone, a few teeth, and a piece of skull. Though these fragments are robust, they hint at Denisovans being well equipped for surviving the tough Pleistocene Asia. Now here's where it gets really interesting. The Denisovans didn't just keep to themselves, they left a mark on us, modern humans. Certain groups today, especially in Asia and Oceania, carry Denisovan DNA. For instance, the indigenous people of Melanesia, including Papua New Guineans, have about 5% of their DNA from Denisovans. This reveals a history of ancient interbreeding that is more complex and common than we ever imagined. Anatomically modern humans interbred with Neanderthals. You can't interbreed with another species. They, they clearly were uh, hum human beings. Denisovans mixed not just with modern humans, but also Neanderthals and possibly another yet unidentified ancient human group. But what about their way of life? The Denisova cave has given us a glimpse yielding sophisticated tools, a bone needle, and even jewellery. These finds suggest a culture and level of sophistication that challenges our understanding of archaic humans. Their discovery of the Denisovans has been a game-changer in evolutionary biology, painting a picture of our past that's far more intricate than previously thought. 
It's not just about who we are, but who we're connected to, revealing a web of interactions among ancient human species across Eurasia. Yet for all we've learned, the Denisovans remain shrouded in mystery. With each fossil fragment and DNA sequence, scientists are slowly piecing together the jigsaw of our ancient past. The Denisovan genome in particular continues to be a treasure trove of information, promising to unlock even more secrets as research progresses. This story is far from over. It's an ongoing journey of discovery into who we are and where we come from. Siberia's Yakutia region, known for its jaw-dropping temperature extremes, is home to a place as intriguing as its ominous name suggests, the Valley of Death. Tucked away in the northeastern part of Siberia, in the Saka Republic, this valley is not just a testament to nature's extremes but also a canvas for mysteries that boggle the mind. What sets this valley apart are the curious metallic structures scattered across its landscape. Picture this, dome-like formations and metal objects, some peeking out of the earth as if partially buried treasures all wrapped in a mystery. Are they ancient artifacts, remnants of meteorite impacts, or something else? The truth is, we're still scratching our heads trying to figure it out. Getting to the Valley of Death is an adventure in itself, it's remote, wildly inhospitable, and the weather swings from scorching summers to winters that would give even the hardiest explorer pause. This makes studying those mysterious structures all the more challenging. Local folklore adds layers of intrigue to the valley. The Yakut people have tales that could make your hair stand on end associating the valley and its metallic mysteries with danger and otherworldly energies. According to legend, these structures could wield unknown powers causing illness or worse to those who dare too close. While these stories add to the valley's mystique, they remain unverified whispers of the past. Scientists, on their part, have theories that could explain the existence of these structures. Some suggest they might be the aftermath of meteorite impacts, pointing to Siberia's history with celestial events like the famous Tunguska explosion. Others speculate they could be the work of ancient humans or a civilization lost to time, leaving behind these puzzling artifacts. But here's the rub. Actually exploring this area is incredibly tough. The extreme climate, the area's seclusion and the sheer lack of infrastructure make sustained research difficult. This scarcity of empirical data means much about the Valley of Death remains a tantalizing mystery. This shroud of mystery isn't just a magnet for scientists. Historians, paranormal enthusiasts and even adventurous tourists are drawn to its secrets. The allure of uncovering more about Siberia's ancient past and its uncharted territories is irresistible. As technology and exploration methods improve, who knows what secrets will unearth from the Valley of Death until then, it remains one of Siberia's most captivating enigmas a place where history, legend, and science converge in the most mysterious of dances. Let's dive into one of Siberia's most mind-boggling mysteries that the Tunguska event of 1908. Imagine a blast so powerful it flattens 80 million trees over an area of 2,150 square kilometers. That's exactly what happened near the Podkamenaya Tunguska River in central Siberia on June 30th, 1908. This wasn't just any old explosion, it was roughly 1,000 times mightier than the Hiroshima atomic bomb. The shock waves from this colossal blast were felt up to 2,000 kilometers away. People at the time reported seeing a bright blue light, almost like a second sun, followed by a series of booms that were strong enough to knock folks off their feet and shatter windows hundreds of kilometers away. Fast forward to 1927, and enter Leonid Kulik, a Russian mineralogist who was the first to scientifically investigate the site. Kulik was expecting to find a meteorite crater, but was met instead with a sea of flattened trees, splayed out from a central point like the spokes of a wheel with not a crater in sight. The most accepted theory, a small asteroid or comet fragment burst through the atmosphere, exploding 5 to 10 kilometers above ground with the force of 10-15 megatons of TNT. But as with all good mysteries, there are other angles, everything from a natural gas explosion from the Earth's belly to wilder notions like antimatter or even a mini black hole having a run-in with our planet. 
The aftermath of this explosion wasn't just a big patch of knocked down trees, it had a significant environmental punch, boosting tree growth in the area and reportedly causing genetic mutations in plants and animals, likely thanks to the extreme heat and shockwave it even had a hand in global atmospheric changes, like the creation of night shining clouds and a dip in atmospheric transparency across Europe and Asia. But here's where it gets even juicier. The Tunguska event has been a hotbed for conspiracy theories and wild speculation. From alien spacecraft crashes to top-secret weapon tests, the event's mysterious nature has sparked imaginations worldwide. Despite decades of research and countless theories, the Tunguska event remains one of the 20th century's most tantalizing unsolved mysteries. It's a real-life sci-fi story, set in the remote Siberian wilderness, that continues to intrigue and puzzle us to this day. Homo sapiens line descends from a line that goes back about six million years, not much further than that, if we accept conventional evolutionary theory. So six million years ago, Antarctica is supposed to have been as cold and as frozen as it is today. And there's, no, there's undoubtedly a time, they found fossils on Antarctica, there's undoubtedly a time when, when Antarctica was, was lush and green. The question is, was it lush and green during the lifetime of the human species? Yes. Graham Hancock's theories about an ancient civilization in Antarctica are quite intriguing, although they veer significantly from mainstream scientific views. He speculates that a part of this lost advanced civilization was located in what's now the icy expanse of Antarctica. This is a striking thought considering Antarctica's current freezing conditions. He links this to the hypothesis of Earth crust displacement. The entire outer crust of the Earth, like the skin of an orange, might shift leaving the core of the Earth in place. This theory suggests that Antarctica wasn't always at the South Pole, but might have been in a more temperate region, allowing a civilization to thrive. However, it's crucial to note that this idea of Earth crust displacement isn't supported by the current scientific understanding of plate tectonics, which doesn't allow for such rapid and dramatic shifts of the Earth's crust. Hancock also delves into mythology, drawing connections between various global myths, legends, and religious texts. He interprets these as allegorical references to this lost civilization, particularly focusing on stories of great floods or cataclysms. He proposes that such a cataclysm, maybe a flood or a comet impact, led to the downfall of this advanced civilization. To me, the obvious answer is we are dealing with the fingerprints of a lost civilization that mapped the world and that left evidence of that mapping. According to his theory, survivors of this catastrophe might have traveled the world, spreading their advanced knowledge, significantly influencing the development of later civilizations like the Egyptians and Sumerians. One of the more fascinating aspects of his theory is how he points out the similarities in architectural structures and astronomical alignments at various ancient sites. He sees these as potential evidence of a shared origin of knowledge, suggesting that this knowledge could have been passed down from the earlier civilization. Hancock believes that this civilization's legacy includes not just advanced architectural techniques and astronomical observations, but potentially other lost technologies and wisdom. The date that Gobekli Tepe in Turkey is built, 11,600 years ago. <laughs> that, weirdly, is the date that Plato's Timaeus and Critias gives for the submergence of Atlantis. While his ideas certainly capture the imagination, it's important to remember that they are viewed with skepticism by the scientific community. Antarctica during the Eocene epoch was a completely different world from what we know today. It was actually positioned over the South Pole, just like it is now. But the climate back then was way warmer, allowing for a whole different kind of environment. This was a time when the continents were still shifting around after the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea. So Antarctica, which was part of what we call Gondwana, was slowly moving to where it sits now, all isolated at the bottom of the world. This shifting around of continents, like Australia and South America moving away, played a big role in changing ocean currents and the climate. One of the most striking things about Antarctica back then was that it didn't have the massive ice sheet it has today. This absence of ice was mainly because of the much warmer global temperatures at the time. This had a big knock-on effect on the planet's climate, as the reflective ice that sends solar radiation back into space wasn't there, adding to the overall warmth. The tectonic movements during the Eocene were also pretty significant. The breakup of Gondwana was a major event reshaping the layout of the Earth's land and water. A key moment was the opening of the Drake Passage, 
the stretch of water between Antarctica and South America. This opening was a game changer because it led to the creation of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which is a massive ocean current that goes around Antarctica. This current had a huge impact on the climate. It kind of put Antarctica in a climatic bubble, circulating cold water around it and stopping the warmer waters from the north from getting through. This is believed to have played a big part in cooling down Antarctica and leading to the ice-covered continent we know today. As for what life was like back then, the fossil records are really fascinating. They show that Antarctica supported a diverse range of plants and even animals. We're talking about temperate to subtropical forests with beaches, conifers and ferns. Imagine that in place of today's icy desert. These fossils tell us the climate was much warmer and humid. And then there's the sea level, which was way higher than what we see now because there weren't those big ice caps locking up all that water. So this is how, how do you know that sea level rose? There are certain corals that can only exist within a certain number of feet of the, of the sea surface. This meant that the coastline and the shape of the land were quite different. And some places that are land now were underwater back then. The warmer temperatures and higher sea levels would have made the marine life around Antarctica rich and diverse, very different from what's there now. The Eocene epoch, which lasted from about 56 to 34 million years ago, was a really interesting time in Earth's history. It was part of this bigger period called the Paleogene period, and it's a part of what scientists call the Cenozoic era. This era is often nicknamed the Age of Mammals because it's when mammals started to diversify a lot, especially after the dinosaurs had their big exit at the end of the Cretaceous period. During the Eocene, the world's continents were on the move, drifting towards where they are now. This movement was a big deal because it changed how ocean currents flowed and affected the climate in a bunch of ways. Now, one of the most dramatic things about the Eocene was this event called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. This happened around 56 million years ago, and it was a time when the Earth got really warm, really fast. Temperatures shot up by 5 to 8 degrees Celsius in just a few thousand years. Scientists think this might have been because of a ton of methane being released from the ocean floor. This warming had a huge impact on life on Earth. In the oceans, some species went extinct, while on land, mammals started to evolve and diversify like crazy. The levels of CO2 in the atmosphere were also way higher than what we have today. Estimates say it was between 1,000 to 2,000 parts per million, which is a lot compared to the pre-industrial level of about 280 ppm. This high level of CO2 came from things like volcanic activity, burning of organic matter, and because natural carbon sinks weren't as effective, one of the big differences between the Eocene and now was that there were no major ice sheets at the poles. This is really different from today, where we've got big ice caps in both the Arctic and Antarctic. Because the Earth was so much warmer, the temperature difference between the equator and the poles wasn't as extreme as it is now. As a result, the polar regions were much warmer than they are today. And because there was less ice, sea levels were higher. This means a lot of water that's currently frozen in ice was in the ocean back then. This affected marine life a lot, changing where different species lived and leading to the development of new types of marine ecosystems. One of the things I find most striking is the presence of Antarctica on ancient maps, because we didn't discover it until 1820. Now, Graham has a really fascinating theory about an ancient advanced civilization that he believes existed long before the civilizations we commonly recognize, like the Sumerians of Mesopotamia. His idea pushes the timeline of advanced human societies back tens of thousands of years, possibly even to the last ice age. This is a huge leap from the established historical understanding, which generally sees complex societies and civilizations emerging more recently. Hancock points to the incredible architectural feats of ancient megalithic structures like those at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, Stonehenge in England, and various sites in Egypt and Mesoamerica. He sees these as evidence of a highly advanced architectural knowledge. Moreover, he talks about the astronomical precision of these structures. For instance, how the Great Pyramids of Giza align with the stars of Orion's belt, or how Stonehenge aligns with the solstices and equinoxes. These aren't just random placements. They suggest a deep understanding of the stars and seasons. He also believes this civilization had impressive navigational skills, which might explain how similar architectural and astronomical concepts appeared across different continents. But it's not just about the buildings and their alignments with celestial events. 
Hancock thinks these ancient monuments reflect a comprehensive knowledge of astronomy that was integrated into the culture and religious practices of the time. He also suggests evidence of sophisticated urban planning in ancient ruins, indicating a level of societal organization and city-building knowledge that's not typically credited to prehistoric societies. Then there's the idea of a global spread of knowledge. Hancock theorizes that the similarities in architectural styles and astronomical knowledge across various ancient cultures around the world point to a common, advanced source of knowledge. This knowledge could have been spread by the survivors of this ancient society. Graham Hancock's theory really takes a global perspective when it comes to the influence of this ancient, advanced civilization he proposes. He thinks that this civilization had a major impact all over the world. It's not just a localized phenomenon, but something that reached across continents. According to him, we can see traces of this civilization in the myths, architectural designs, and astronomical knowledge of many different ancient cultures. He's suggesting that there's a kind of cultural diffusion that took place from this lost civilization to later societies. So when we see similar styles in buildings or common themes in religious beliefs and astronomical practices across various ancient cultures, he interprets this as evidence of their influence. He goes further to speculate that after some huge disaster that brought this civilization down, the survivors might have spread out to different areas of the world. These survivors, he believes, were the ones who passed on their advanced knowledge and this played a crucial role in the development of the civilizations we know about from history, like the Egyptians and Sumerians. Now, when it comes to evidence, Hancock looks at archaeological sites and findings that he feels mainstream archaeology hasn't been able to fully explain. He talks about structures that, to him, seem like they needed pretty advanced engineering or astronomical know-how to build. He also dives into ancient texts and myths, interpreting them not just as stories or legends, but as allegorical records of real historical events. Think of tales about great floods or lost lands like Atlantis. Hancock sees these as collective memories of the lost civilization. He also notes that there are these cross-cultural similarities, like how myths from different parts of the world seem to share common themes, or how architectural styles and astronomical knowledge seem to echo each other even across cultures that supposedly never interacted. To Hancock, this points to a shared, older source of knowledge. One thing that they used to say is, Hancock can't be right because there was no global cataclysm, you know, 12 or 13,000 years ago. Well, now we know there was, and there are various explanations for it. Right at the epicenter of this cataclysm was a civilization that we would regard as advanced, not a simple hunter-gatherer civilization, which was utterly wiped out uh, in this cataclysmic event. Graham Hancock's interpretation of the Piri race map created in 1513 by the Ottoman admiral and cartographer Piri Reis, presents a fascinating narrative about the knowledge of ancient civilizations. The map, discovered in 1929 in the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, Turkey, has only about one-third of its original content preserved. Despite this, the map's detail and coverage, including parts of Europe, North Africa, and the Brazilian coast, are noteworthy. The scale of the map is inconsistent, a common feature in early cartography, and it includes various annotations and illustrations. This is a very neglected area of the world, uh, as far as deep and ancient archaeology goes. If you're going to propose a lost civilization, you need, there are certain preconditions. Piri Reis himself indicated that the map was compiled using various earlier sources, including charts from Christopher Columbus and possibly older maps, which might have included Western and Eastern, including Arabic navigational charts. Hancock's interpretation of the map primarily focuses on its depiction of the Antarctic coastline. He claims that the map shows the northern coastline of Antarctica in a largely ice-free state, which, according to him, last occurred more than 6,000 years ago. This assertion, if true, would imply a significant historical anomaly, suggesting that ancient seafarers might have charted Antarctica long before it was officially discovered. However, this interpretation is contentious, Critics argue that the so-called Antarctic coast could be a misrepresentation or misinterpretation of the South American coast, or even an imaginative addition, not uncommon in early cartography. In 1513, when Piri Reis uh, drew the map, Antarctica had not been discovered. Uh, in fact, it wasn't discovered until 1880 by our civilization. It incorporates highly accurate relative longitudes. 
To do longitudes accurately on maps requires a chronometer, a marine chronometer that will keep accurate time at sea. And again, this was something that our civilization couldn't do until the late 18th century. Another intriguing aspect of the Piri race map, according to Hancock, is its accuracy in longitude in certain sections. He posits that this level of accuracy indicates a more advanced knowledge of navigation and geography than what was available at the time. However, this claim is debated by scholars who argue that the accuracies could be coincidental or exaggerated since accurate methods for measuring longitude were not developed until the 18th century. Hancock also suggests that the map depicts mountain ranges in Antarctica, which were unknown and under ice until recent times. This, he believes, further points to ancient knowledge of geography. Critics, however, counter that these features could be inaccuracies, such as misdrawn coastlines or symbolic illustrations, rather than representations of actual geographical features. Graham Hancock's hypothesis about advanced ancient knowledge, particularly as seen through the lens of ancient maps like the Piri Rice map, certainly stirs up a conversation about our understanding of historical and archaeological knowledge. Hancock points out that these maps display a level of geographical detail that seems remarkably accurate, especially when you consider the time they were created. For example, the Piri Race map, which includes detailed coastlines and island locations, seems to suggest a level of knowledge that surpasses what was known or should have been possible at the time. It's quite intriguing, really. One of the more captivating aspects of Hancock's theory is the suggestion that some of these maps show features that were not officially recognized until much later. Well, this map was drawn in 1813. It's the Pinkerton world map, um, and it's based on the latest science available in 1813. So Antarctica isn't there. Why isn't Antarctica there? Because it's an honest map. They hadn't discovered it in 1813. So it's very odd in my view that Antarctica appears on much older source ma maps, which themselves are based on even older source maps. Um, Take, for instance, his interpretation of the Antarctic coast as depicted on the Piri Race map, a region not known in the 16th century. This leads Hancock to speculate that these maps could have been based on even older sources, possibly from a forgotten civilization that had extensively charted the globe. It's as if he's hinting at a lost chapter in human history one that recorded the Earth with surprising accuracy and detail. When we dive into the technological implications of his theory, things get even more interesting. Hancock suggests that the creators of these original source maps must have had advanced navigational skills, including the accurate measurement of longitude. A significant challenge that wasn't resolved until much later with the invention of marine chronometers in the 18th century, the precision in these maps, particularly in terms of latitudinal and longitudinal readings, implies a level of cartographic sophistication that seems out of place in the historical timeline as we understand it. It's as if these mapmakers had tools and knowledge that history says they shouldn't have had. Graham Hancock's ideas about the loss and transmission of ancient knowledge are quite captivating, weaving together a narrative that stretches across time and civilizations. He proposes that a wealth of geographical knowledge, once possessed by an advanced ancient civilization, was largely lost due to cataclysmic events or perhaps the gradual decline of this civilization. It's a, it's a navigational device, it's, uh, it, it, it's a geared, cogged uh, mm. system that allows you to track the passage of time and figure out where you are. Again, that testifies to a lost navigational skill that, yes. we, that we have not taken account of. Before. It's a thought-provoking idea suggesting that what we know of our past might just be the tip of the iceberg. Hancock believes that some remnants of this knowledge managed to survive and eventually influenced the cartographic work of later civilizations, including those in the medieval and renaissance periods. Hancock delves into how this information could have been passed down. He suggests a variety of channels, including oral traditions, mythological texts, and even surviving cartographic materials, which later mapmakers like Piri Reis might have used. Imagine, for a moment, ancient mariners passing down stories of distant lands and seas, with these tales eventually finding their way into the maps and charts of later generations. One of the more intriguing aspects of Hancock's hypothesis is his connection with myths and legends from different cultures around the world. He often draws parallels between these stories and the idea of advanced prehistoric knowledge and global cataclysms, such as the great flood narratives found in many cultures. 
In Hancock's view, these myths and legends aren't just fanciful stories, they're potential historical records, allegorical but based on real events and knowledge from these lost civilizations. It's a narrative that challenges us to think beyond conventional historical accounts, suggesting that our ancestors might have known far more about the world than we give them credit for. You see, the, the, the one thing there's no dispute about anymore uh, is that the Younger Dryas was a cataclysm. The, 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 the megafauna that, uh, that, that die off, the disruption of human activity that takes place at that time, the huge climate changes, this was a cataclysm by any standards. Where the argument still goes on is what caused the, what caused the cataclysm. Graham Hancock has this really interesting, if somewhat controversial, hypothesis about a global cataclysm that he believes occurred around 10,600 BCE. He suggests that Earth was hit by a comet or a series of comet impacts at this time, leading to massive environmental and climatic upheavals worldwide. This idea is particularly interesting because he links it to the Younger Dryas period, a well-documented era of abrupt climate change that started around 12,900 years ago and lasted for about 1,300 years. The Younger Dryas is known for a sudden shift back to colder and drier conditions following a period of warming after the last ice age. Hancock posits that this comet impact could have been the trigger for this dramatic climatic shift. What's intriguing is how Hancock uses ice core samples from Greenland and Antarctica to support his theory. These ice cores, which provide a detailed record of past temperatures and atmospheric compositions, show evidence of a rapid climatic change during the Younger Dryas. He sees this as a smoking gun, indicating a major impact event. He also points to geological evidence like sediment layers that show signs of sudden environmental changes, further supporting his comet impact theory. We see all the megafauna dying off suddenly and rapidly. We see rises in sea level. We see a huge collapse in, in global temperature. What is becoming clearer and, and clearer uh, is that the evidence that a comet behind it was behind it is, is extremely strong. But Hancock doesn't stop there. He goes on to suggest that this hypothesized comet impact had profound effects on both flora and fauna, including contributing to the extinction of many large mammal species during what's known as the Pleistocene megafauna extinction. The changes in vegetation and ecosystems, he argues, would have had cascading effects on wildlife and human populations alike. For human societies, Hancock believes this event was catastrophic, causing significant disruptions and leading to the loss of advanced knowledge and cultural practices of prehistoric civilizations. It's like he's suggesting a kind of cultural amnesia, where societies forgot the advancements they had made. And then there's this fascinating idea that survivors of this cataclysm might have passed on fragments of their advanced knowledge to other cultures, influencing the development of future civilizations. It's a narrative that makes you wonder about the connections between ancient civilizations and how knowledge could have been transferred across generations and geographies in ways we might not fully understand. Everybody's heard about the Aztecs. Everybody's heard about the Maya. But before the Aztecs and before the Maya, there were a culture who are referred to as the Olmecs. I explored the Olmec mystery uh, in considerable depth. At the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, an era brimming with curiosity and the spirit of discovery, the ancient civilizations of Mesoamerica began to captivate scholars and adventurers alike. This period, steeped in Victorian era fascination, saw ancient cultures not as relics of the past, but as windows into a grand, albeit lost, world. The settlement story of the Americas is much more complicated uh, than we've you know, than we, than we've realized. Fueled by a mix of exploration, colonization, and a penchant for romanticizing the unknown, people were drawn to the mysteries that ancient societies held. Institutions in Europe and the United States, including museums and universities, recognized the value of understanding these indigenous civilizations. They began to fund expeditions, not just for the sake of collecting artifacts, but to delve deeper into the history and culture of these ancient peoples. This marked a significant shift in archaeology, transforming it from a quest for treasures to a scientific discipline focused on careful excavation and analysis. This is part of a, a curious mystery that is not unconnected to the genetic mystery. The Olmec civilization, with its colossal heads and intricate stone structures, was one of the earliest to be uncovered. 
Yet in these initial stages, many artifacts were mistakenly attributed to the more familiar Maya and Aztec civilizations. This was largely due to their apparent similarities in artistic style and because these civilizations were better understood at the time. Uh, it's been known by archaeologists for quite a long time that there are anomalous skulls uh, in parts of Brazil. The unique aspects of Olmec art and iconography were not immediately recognized, highlighting the challenges faced by early archaeologists in differentiating between the complex cultures of the region. Two figures who played a pivotal role in bringing the wonders of Mesoamerica to the Western world were John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood. Their expeditions, documented in Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas and Yucatan, and Incidents of Travel in Yucatan, not only introduced the Maya civilization to many, but also set a standard for future archaeological work. Their detailed illustrations and engaging narratives captured the imagination of the public, sparking a wave of interest in ancient Mesoamerican cultures. This era also saw the beginnings of comparative archaeology, where discoveries from Mesoamerica were placed in a global context, offering new perspectives on the development of human societies. Museums evolved from mere collections of curiosities to centers of research and education, significantly contributing to the dissemination of knowledge about these ancient cultures. Furthermore, the late 19th and early 20th centuries witnessed the emergence of interdisciplinary approaches in archaeology, incorporating anthropology, linguistics, and even early environmental science, which enriched the understanding of Mesoamerican civilizations. The story of how the colossal stone heads became recognized as a key to understanding the Olmec civilization is a fascinating tale of curiosity, exploration, and eventual enlightenment within the archaeological world. Initially stumbled upon by Western archaeologists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, these massive sculptures, some towering over nine feet tall and weighing several tons, presented a mystery. But what's fascinating about them is they are, they are supposedly the first high civilization of Central America. With their distinctive facial features, including flat noses and fleshy cheeks and often adorned with helmet-like headgear, they captivated those who found them but left many questions unanswered. What, what do we think those helmets were that they were wearing? Nobody knows because no physical example of such a helmet has ever been found, just like no physical example of an Egyptian pharaoh's helm a crown has, has ever been found. The first significant acknowledgement of these heads came from Jose Melgari Serrano in 1862, when he uncovered one at Tres Zapotes in Veracruz. Melgar described the sculpture as having Ethiopian features, a reflection of the era's interpretations and biases, underscoring how little was known about the Olmecs then. Although Melgar's discovery was groundbreaking, it was initially seen as an isolated find rather than evidence of a broader, unknown civilization. For decades, these colossal heads were viewed more as curious anomalies rather than vital cultural artifacts. Without a wider archaeological context, their true significance was overlooked, and they were sometimes wrongly attributed to other known civilizations like the Maya or Aztec, or even to entirely speculative, unknown cultures. It was a puzzle missing its broader picture, waiting for the pieces to be put together. The narrative began to shift in the mid-20th century, thanks to more focused and systematic excavations in the Olmec heartland, led by archaeologists such as Matthew Sterling. These efforts unearthed additional colossal heads alongside other artifacts, helping to piece together the puzzle of the Olmec civilization. It was through this dedicated work that the Olmecs were finally recognized as a distinct and influential culture in Mesoamerica, predating and potentially influencing subsequent civilizations like the Maya and Aztecs. In 1945, a groundbreaking expedition led by Matthew Sterling to San Lorenzo Tenochtitlan dramatically advanced our understanding of the Olmec civilization, an enigmatic culture that laid the foundational stones of Mesoamerican history. Recognizing the potential significance of these sites, the Smithsonian Institution stepped in, providing the necessary support and funding for a more thorough exploration. The vastness of San Lorenzo, spreading across several kilometers, presented another hurdle. It was impossible to excavate the entire site in one go, so Sterling and his team had to make strategic decisions about where to dig, prioritizing areas where surface finds indicated the presence of significant artifacts. This meticulous approach to excavation was critical, requiring careful planning, mapping, 
and a methodical technique to ensure the delicate artifacts, some centuries old, were preserved for future study. As they cleared the jungle overgrowth and dug into the ancient soil, Sterling's team was not just unearthing artifacts, they were also piecing together the story of the Olmec civilization. Every artifact, every stone, and every fragment of pottery added a new chapter to our understanding of this ancient culture. The detailed recording and documentation of their findings were essential, providing a basis for future analysis and helping to paint a fuller picture of the Olmec way of life. San Lorenzo, dating back to around 1200 to 900 BCE, stands as a monumental beacon in the study of Mesoamerican history, often celebrated as the oldest major city in the region. This ancient city predates the civilizations of the Maya and Aztecs, providing a unique glimpse into the dawn of complex societies in the Americas. Thanks to radiocarbon dating, researchers have been able to pin down the timeline of San Lorenzo, offering a clearer view of the Olmec civilization's early days. Among the most striking discoveries at San Lorenzo, the site has yielded jade figurines and Celts, indicating robust trade networks and the cultural significance of jade. An array of pottery styles found at the site offers insights into daily life, artistic expression, and the Olmec's trade relations. The discovery of large structures, including platforms and possible elite residences, points to a highly organized society capable of mobilizing significant labor resources. The urban layout of San Lorenzo, organized around a central axis, reflects a thoughtfully planned development. The existence of distinct ceremonial and residential areas suggests a sophisticated urban structure, possibly mirroring social hierarchies within the Olmec society. In the 1950s, the archaeological spotlight turned to La Venta, an Olmec site in Tabasco, Mexico, building on the momentum of earlier discoveries at San Lorenzo. This shift marked a significant phase in unraveling the mysteries of the Olmec civilization, regarded as one of the earliest complex societies in Mesoamerica. With a renewed interest in the Olmec culture, archaeologists like Philip Drucker and Robert Heiser applied advanced methods and interdisciplinary approaches to dig deeper into the site's secrets, offering a more comprehensive understanding of this ancient civilization. La Venta thrived between approximately 900 to 400 BCE, a period that witnessed the peak of Olmec cultural and artistic development. This era underscored the Olmec's remarkable achievements in architecture, art, and urban planning, setting a precedent for subsequent Mesoamerican cultures. Among the distinct features of La Venta is the Great Pyramid, a monumental structure made of earth and clay, noted for its unique conical shape. Unlike the pyramidal structures that would later dominate Mesoamerican landscapes, the Great Pyramid's design and scale highlight the Olmec's advanced engineering skills and their capacity for organizing large-scale construction projects. This pyramid, along with other structures at the site, was aligned with celestial bodies, hinting at the Olmec's sophisticated understanding of astronomy and suggesting its role as a ceremonial and cultural hub. The systematic excavation efforts at La Venta brought to light not only architectural innovations but also a wealth of artifacts, including the iconic colossal heads carved from basalt, believed to represent rulers or significant figures within Olmec society. Similarly, altars adorned with intricate carvings provided glimpses into the civilization's mythology and rituals. La Venta also revealed complex burial sites and offerings, including serpentine mosaic pavements, which offered insights into the civilization's funerary practices and religious beliefs. These findings have been instrumental in piecing together the social structure, religious practices and artistic achievements of the Olmec civilization, significantly influencing the study of Mesoamerican archaeology. However, the preservation of La Venta faces challenges due to the tropical climate and human factors, underscoring the importance of ongoing research and conservation efforts. The exploration of La Venta in the 1950s was a watershed moment in understanding the depth and complexity of the Olmec civilization, providing a foundation for future studies and ensuring the legacy of this pivotal culture in Mesoamerican history remains appreciated and preserved. The Amazon Basin is 7 million square kilometers in area. And within it, 5.5 million square kilometers remains almost entirely unstudied by archaeologists. We've done world archaeology, but we've just ignored the Amazon. 
What we find in the Amazon are thousands of henges that are now beginning to emerge from the cleared area of the jungle and others that have been identified for the first time with LIDAR. Discoveries of ancient civilizations in the Amazon jungle have unveiled a complex and sophisticated history that challenges previous assumptions about the region. These discoveries, made through a combination of aerial surveys, satellite imagery, and ground expeditions, reveal the existence of large, well-planned urban settlements, extensive road networks, and advanced agricultural techniques, suggesting a much higher level of social organization and environmental management than previously thought. The Kuhikugu complex in the upper Xingu region of the Brazilian Amazon offers an incredible glimpse into the advanced urban planning and societal organization of pre-Columbian civilizations long before European contact. Nestled in the remote Amazon basin in present-day Mato Grosso, Brazil, this area is a treasure trove of biodiversity. The dense rainforests and network of rivers likely played a key role in the development and sustenance of this complex society. Covering about 50 square kilometers, the Kuhikugu complex is home to over 20 settlements. These aren't just randomly placed, they're strategically positioned to make the most of the region's natural resources. What's fascinating is how these settlements are connected. Imagine a series of straight roads, some stretching for several kilometers, laid out with such precision that they often align with the cardinal directions. This not only facilitated travel, but also shows a high level of planning and coordination. Then there's the canal system, an impressive display of hydraulic engineering, likely used for everything from transportation to water management and maybe even fish farming. The variety of structures within the complex is equally remarkable. From large public buildings and ceremonial spaces to individual homes, the architecture reflects a hierarchy in building techniques, hinting at different social or functional roles within the society. And speaking of society, Estimates suggest that at its peak, Kuhikugu could have supported a whopping 30,000 to 50,000 people. This is deduced from the sheer number of residential structures and the expanse of agricultural land. Uh, along the Amazon, he reported seeing incredible cities, advanced arts and crafts, millions of people, a thriving culture. Uh, the rediscovery of the Kuhikugu complex in the Amazon is a fascinating story that blends modern technology with traditional archaeology. Initially, this hidden gem was revealed through aerial surveys and satellite images. Imagine flying over the dense Amazon rainforest and suddenly spotting the outlines of an ancient civilization. Then, archaeologists like Michael Heckenberger and his team took over, conducting extensive ground excavations. They employed advanced techniques like LIDAR, which is like X-ray vision for archaeologists, to see through the forest canopy and map the area accurately. Now let's talk about how old this place is. Using carbon dating, a method to tell the age of artifacts and soil, scientists figured out that people lived in the Kuhikugu complex for several centuries, dating back to as early as 800 AD. They found all sorts of things like pottery, stone tools and ornaments, giving us a glimpse into the daily life and creativity of the people who lived there. Here's the kicker. Before finding Kuhikugu, many thought the Amazon was mostly an untouched wilderness before Europeans arrived. But this discovery turned that idea on its head, showing that the area was home to a large and complex society. It's like finding a hidden chapter of history in your backyard. This place shows us that humans had a big impact on the Amazon way earlier than we thought. They even made their own super fertile soil called Terra Preta, which is still rich and productive today. What's really cool about Kuhikugu is how it shows that the people there knew how to live sustainably. They had advanced farming practices, managed water well, and lived in harmony with their environment. It's like they were eco-friendly before it was trendy. This discovery also made us rethink the role of indigenous societies in the Amazon. It turns out they knew a lot about how to manage the land and shape the landscape. It's a reminder of how important it is to value and learn from indigenous knowledge. And lastly, the biodiversity in the Amazon today might partly be thanks to these ancient civilizations. The variety of plants near these archaeological sites is way more than in other areas of the forest. The Amazon is basically a garden. The Amazon is a man-made rainforest. Uh, there are certain trees like Brazil nut trees or the ice cream bean tree, which are food crops, which are very, very valuable. Marajo Island at the Amazon River's mouth is like a time capsule that takes us back to the Marajoara culture, 
a sophisticated civilization from around 800 to 1400 CE. Imagine an island almost as big as Switzerland, right at the meeting point of a river and the ocean. This place, with its mix of forests, savannas and wetlands, is not just big but also incredibly diverse. It's the perfect backdrop for the Marahuara people to thrive, providing everything from food to resources for their unique lifestyle. Now, the Marahuara culture is something special. They were known for their artistic flair, especially their ceramics. Picture pots and plates with intricate designs, complex patterns and images of animals and people. They weren't just making these for fun. Their ceramics were a big part of their culture and beliefs, like the large, beautifully decorated urns they used for burials. These suggest they had quite complex ideas about life, death and everything in between, but it's not just their art that's fascinating. They built these massive earthen mounds, some over 10 meters high. Think about that. That's like stacking three buses on top of each other. These mounds were probably used for everything from homes to ceremonial sites and might have even protected them from the frequent floods. This shows they were pretty savvy engineers and architects, adapting to their challenging environment in style. The way they organized their society was also quite something. It seems there was a clear hierarchy, with some people leading the way in managing resources and religious practices. And they had different roles for men and women which we can figure out from the things they left behind. Now let's talk about their farming skills. They were ahead of their time, creating raised fields to keep their crops safe from flooding. Their diet was a mix of what they grew, along with fish and game from the surrounding area. And they were smart about managing water with their canals and ditches, which was pretty crucial in a place that floods a lot. Santa Rem, right where the Tapajos meets the Amazon River, is a fascinating place, especially when you think about its history. This spot was like the Grand Central Station of its time, bustling with trade and culture. Picture boats coming in and out, carrying all sorts of goods and ideas from different parts of South America. The area around Santa Rem was rich in resources, which helped the settlement thrive. Now, the people of Santa Rem were known for their incredible pottery. We're talking about really intricate designs here, geometric patterns, pictures of people and animals, and even mythical beings. The level of detail in these pots and plates is just mind-blowing. And it wasn't just about looking good. These designs tell us a lot about their culture and beliefs. The way they made this pottery was pretty advanced too. They had techniques for molding, firing and painting that were way ahead of their time. The variety of colors and the way they used glazes show they really knew their stuff when it came to chemistry and kiln construction. It's like they were the master chefs of pottery, knowing exactly how to cook up the perfect piece. Santa Rem was more than just a local market. It was a cultural hub. The different styles and motifs in the pottery suggest they were mixing it up with all sorts of cultures. And it wasn't just goods they were trading. They were probably swapping stories, ideas and practices too. The town itself, from what we can tell from the ruins, was pretty well organized. They had different areas for living, working and probably for community gatherings or ceremonies. It's like they had their own little urban planning going on. But back to the pottery, it's not just about how it was made, but what it tells us about the people of Santa Rem. It gives us a peek into their daily lives, what they valued, and how they connected with others. The geoglyphs in the Amazon, especially in the Brazilian states of Acre and Rondonia, are like a secret world that's been hidden under the dense forest canopy for centuries. It wasn't until the late 20th and early 21st centuries, mostly because of deforestation, that these incredible earthworks started to come to light, thanks to technology like satellite imagery and LIDAR, which is basically like having X-ray vision from space, over 450 of these geoglyphs have been mapped. This discovery has completely changed our view of how people lived in the Amazon before Columbus. Now these aren't just a few lines in the dirt. We're talking about huge designs that can stretch over a kilometer and cover several square kilometers. They come in all sorts of shapes, circles, squares, rectangles, and more intricate forms. Some even have patterns like radial spokes which add to their complexity. The sheer size of these geoglyphs hints at a society that was really well organized and could bring together a lot of people to create these massive works. But how did they make them? Well, they would remove the top layer of soil and vegetation, revealing the lighter colored earth underneath. This contrast made the design stand out when viewed from above. It seems like they used a variety of tools made from materials like stone, bone and wood. 
The level of precision in these geoglyphs shows they were not only skilled but also had serious planning chops. Some of these geoglyphs line up with astronomical events, like the solstices and equinoxes. This suggests they might have been used for tracking celestial events or for ceremonial or religious purposes. Imagine large groups of people gathering at these geoglyphs for festivals or rituals. It must have been quite a sight. But here's the really cool part. These geoglyphs tell us that the societies in the Amazon before Europeans arrived were much more complex than we thought. They could modify their environment on a large scale and had a social structure where leaders could organize big projects. And despite the size of these geoglyphs, they were made in a way that respected and integrated with the surrounding landscape. So discovering these geoglyphs has really turned our understanding of the Amazon's history on its head. It's no longer seen as just a vast, untouched wilderness, but as a place where complex, organized societies lived and actively shaped their world. It's a reminder of how much history there is still to uncover and how much we can learn from it. But before the Aztecs and before the Maya, there were a culture who are referred to as the Olmecs. The settlement story of the Americas is much more complicated uh, than we've, you know, than we than we've realized. And and what the what the DNA is doing is uh, it's telling us that there was something really weird, weird. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a growing fascination with ancient civilizations, particularly in the Victorian era. This interest was driven by a mix of cultural trends in exploration, colonization, and a certain romantic allure attached to discovering lost cultures. Major institutions like museums and universities, primarily in Europe and the US, started funding expeditions to unearth ancient artifacts and understand the history of indigenous civilizations in the Americas. It was a time when archaeology began to evolve from just hunting for treasures to a more scientific approach, focusing on careful excavation and detailed analysis. One of the things I've realized is that there is no classic Native American feature, that, that Na Native Americans are, uh, a very, have a very complex genetic story with very many different elements uh, br brought into it, and we shouldn't be necessarily surprised by the supposedly non-Native American look. Interestingly, during this period, many artifacts, especially the colossal heads and stone structures found in the Olmec region, were often wrongly attributed to other well-known civilizations like the Maya or Aztec. This was largely because the unique aspects of Olmec art and iconography weren't immediately recognized, partly due to a lack of an overall framework to understand the region's history before Columbus. A couple of notable explorers, John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood, played a significant role in stirring up interest in Mesoamerican cultures with their explorations and writings, particularly their books on travels in Central America and Yucatan. Their detailed accounts and illustrations captured the public's imagination, sparking a wave of interest in these ancient cultures. While they mainly focused on the Maya, their approach to systematically document their findings and blend travel narratives with scholarly observations greatly influenced future archaeologists studying Mesoamerica. Uh, it's been known by archaeologists for quite a long time that there are anomalous skulls uh, in parts of Brazil, uh, which appear to show uh, very strongly Polynesian or African features, very much like the features that we see mm. on, the, on the Olmec heads. Around this time, there was also a trend in comparative archaeology, where discoveries from different parts of the world were compared, helping to place Mesoamerican civilizations in a global context. Museums began to transition from just storing artifacts to becoming centers of research and education, playing a crucial role in spreading knowledge about ancient cultures. This era also marked the start of interdisciplinary approaches in archaeology, integrating fields like anthropology, linguistics, and early forms of environmental science. This broader, more inclusive approach helped in piecing together a more comprehensive understanding of ancient civilizations, including the intriguing and complex Olmec culture. Back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when Western archaeologists were exploring Mesoamerica, they started coming across these massive stone heads. Some of them were over nine feet tall and weighed several tons, with distinctive features like flat noses and fleshy cheeks, often adorned with helmet-like headgear. But here's the thing. 
Despite their impressive size and unique features, their true cultural significance wasn't immediately understood. What they're most famous for is these huge carved human heads, uh, which can be on a scale of up to 20 to 25 tons, which have curious features which have been interpreted variously as Polynesian, African, don't look like classic uh, Native American features. One of the earliest significant findings was made by Jose Melgari Serrano in 1862 at Tres Zapotes in Veracruz. He unearthed what we now know as one of the first Olmec colossal heads. Melgari Serrano even described the head as having Ethiopian features, which tells us a lot about the perceptions and biases of that era. But, and this is crucial, his discovery didn't really spark a broader understanding of the Olmec culture right away. For a long time, these heads were seen more as intriguing oddities rather than pieces of a larger cultural puzzle. It took several decades and a lot more digging before the significance of these heads truly began to be appreciated. Initially, many people thought these artifacts might belong to other known civilizations, like the Maya or Aztec, because the idea of the Olmecs being a distinct early Mesoamerican civilization hadn't quite taken shape yet. It wasn't until the mid-20th century, with more systematic excavations led by archaeologists like Matthew Sterling, that the true picture began to emerge. They found more colossal heads and other artifacts, and this really helped to establish the Olmecs as a significant and influential civilization in their own right, predating and possibly even influencing others like the Maya and the Aztecs. Back in 1945, a really important expedition took place, led by this guy named Matthew Sterling, he and his team headed to San Lorenzo, right in the heart of what was once Olmec territory. This wasn't just any random adventure, it was a big deal because the Smithsonian Institution was backing it. They saw the potential in figuring out more about the Olmec sites, which could really shed some light on Mesoamerican prehistory. Before Sterling got there, there had been some poking around in the area, mostly because people kept finding these huge stone heads. These finds were intriguing but didn't quite give the full picture. So enter Sterling. He was already pretty well known in archaeology circles and had a real knack for Mesoamerican cultures. He was the perfect guy to take on such a complex task. Now, it wasn't an easy job. The San Lorenzo site was in this tropical area, covered in thick jungle. Just getting to the site and starting to dig was a huge challenge. They had to clear a bunch of jungle without messing up any artifacts that might be hiding there. And let me tell you, the weather didn't make things any easier. It was humid unpredictable and not the best for keeping ancient artifacts in one piece. The site itself was huge, spreading out over several kilometers. Sterling and his team had to figure out where to start digging because there was no way they could cover the whole area. They did an initial survey which took a lot of time and planning, and then decided on the most promising spots to start excavating. They had to be super careful with how they dug things up. The artifacts were old and fragile, especially with the humidity. Plus, they had to keep track of everything they found, where they found it, and all the details, which was crucial for understanding the site later on. It wasn't something the Maya made up. The Olmecs used that same symbolism, so the Mayan calendar is actually an Olmec calendar. What they found at San Lorenzo was amazing. It turned out to be one of the oldest big cities in Mesoamerica, dating way back to around 1200 to 900 BCE. That's even before civilizations like the Maya and Aztecs that most people are familiar with. The artifacts they unearthed, especially those massive stone heads, were a big deal. They were carved from single blocks of basalt and had all these unique facial features. It was clear that the people who made them were incredibly skilled. All this hard work at San Lorenzo really helped piece together the story of the Olmecs. It gave us a clearer timeline and showed just how complex and advanced their society was. Diving deeper into San Lorenzo, which is super important when it comes to understanding the Olmec civilization, it's considered the oldest major city in Mesoamerica, dating back to around 1200 to 900 BCE. That's way before other famous civilizations like the Maya and Aztecs. Radiocarbon dating was key here. It helped archaeologists nail down the timeline of the site, giving a much clearer picture of when the Olmecs were doing their thing. Now, the most famous stuff they found at San Lorenzo definitely the colossal heads. These huge sculptures were carved from single basalt blocks and are known for their unique facial features like almond-shaped eyes and broad noses. A lot of them have these intricate headdresses too, which might have been a sign of high status or had some ceremonial purpose, but there's still a lot of debate about what all the symbols mean. 
The size of these heads is just mind-blowing. Some are up to 3 meters high and weigh around 50 tons. Imagine the skill it took to carve those. But it wasn't just the heads. They found jade figurines and a bunch of different pottery styles, which tell us a lot about their daily life, art, and even trade. The jade stuff suggests they had trade networks because jade wasn't just lying around everywhere. And the buildings. They found large structures like platforms and what might have been houses for the elite. This points to a society that was really well organized and had the resources to build big. The way San Lorenzo was laid out is also fascinating. It had a central axis, which indicates that the city was carefully planned. There were separate areas for ceremonies and living, showing a sophisticated urban structure and hinting at a social hierarchy. All this stuff from San Lorenzo has been super important for understanding the Olmecs. It's given us a much clearer timeline of their civilization and shown just how complex their society was. The variety in the artifacts, from the colossal heads to the pottery, shows that they were not only skilled in stone carving, but had artists and craftsmen who were really good at what they did. It's like San Lorenzo has given us a window into a past world, showing us how these ancient people lived, worked, and created. After the exciting discoveries at San Lorenzo in the 1940s, archaeologists turned their attention to La Venta, another key Olmec site in Tabasco, Mexico, in the 1950s. This shift was a big deal because La Venta offered a new window into the Olmec world. Known as one of the earliest complex societies in Mesoamerica, the explorations here were more focused and methodical, thanks to archaeologists like Philip Drucker and Robert Heiser. These guys weren't just digging around, they brought in techniques from other fields like anthropology and geology, giving a fuller picture of the Olmec civilization. La Venta is super important for understanding the peak of Olmec culture, the site was in its prime from around 900 to 400 BCE, a time when the Olmecs were really showing off their artistic and architectural skills. One of the standout features of Leventa is the Great Pyramid. It's not like the pyramids in Egypt, this one's made of earth and clay and has a unique conical shape. It was one of the biggest structures in ancient Mesoamerica at the time, which tells us the Olmecs were pretty good at organizing big construction projects. The pyramid was probably more than just a big building, it's believed to have been a key spot for ceremonies or religious activities, kind of like the heart of Olmec ritual life, the way they built it and other structures at Laventa, and how they aligned them with astronomical bodies, shows they were pretty savvy with engineering and astronomy. It was likely a bustling cultural hub, where significant ceremonies and gatherings happened. When archaeologists started digging at Laventa, they did things a bit differently than before. They were super systematic about it, focusing on layers of soil and the context of each artifact they found. But they had their work cut out for them. The tropical climate and the fact that many Olmec structures were made of earth really made preserving and understanding these finds tough. They had to be meticulous in recording everything they dug up, which has been a gold mine for future analysis. Now, just like at San Lorenzo, La Venta is famous for its massive basalt heads, Carved from huge boulders, these heads are thought to be representations of Olmec rulers or other big shots in their society. But there's more. The site is full of altars with intricate carvings, showing people, animals and all sorts of symbolic scenes. It's like getting a glimpse into their mythology and rituals. And then there's the jade. Leventa turned up loads of jade artifacts from beautifully carved figurines to Celts. These weren't just pretty things to look at. They showed how skilled the Olmecs were and hinted at long trade networks, since jade wasn't just lying around nearby. But here's where it gets really interesting. The burial sites they found were complex, with all kinds of elaborate practices. They also found mosaic pavements made of serpentine and various offerings, which likely had deep religious meaning. All this stuff from Laventa has been super important in piecing together who the Olmecs were, their social structure, religious beliefs, and artistic talents. However, keeping Laventa in good shape for future studies is a challenge, the site's battling both natural elements and human factors, so preserving this amazing place is crucial, not just for archaeology buffs, but for understanding a key part of human history.